Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what promises to be an engaging and thought-provoking conversation with two very talented and diverse authors. So I have with me today, I have Lynn Hemphill and Susie Williamson. Uh, thanks for waving, everybody. And today we'll be exploring the importance of diversity in literature, including representation of disability and LGBTQ plus experiences, as well as discussing the different paths to publishing and the resources available for writers from underrepresented backgrounds. Our first panelist, Lynn, is a Kenyan born author who has published several books across various genres, including sapphic romances and stories featuring witches, gods and mermaids. Uh, um, Lynn is known for incorporating films of trauma and mental health struggles into her writing, drawing on her own experiences to create relatable and nuanced characters. Our second panellist, Susie Williams, is the award-winning author of the Blood Gift Chronicles fantasy series that explores themes of wildlife, social justice, magic and more. Susie is also an artist and a spoken word poet and regularly performs in her hometown of Exeter and beyond. So we're delighted to have both Lynn and Susie here with us today to share their insights and experiences as writers from diverse backgrounds. So if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll read them out at the end of the session. So without further ado, let's, di let's dive straight into the discussion. So to begin with, with both of you, and um, um, thank you, by the way, for being here today. So can we start off uh, by, um, if each of you just talk a little bit about yourselves, maybe perhaps if you feel comfortable a bit about your own identities, and your lived experiences. Who's, who's volunteering to go first? <laughs> do I have to pick I on I don't somebody? mind, or Lynn, do you want to go first? Okay. So you go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I'm a chatterbox. Um, lived experiences in relation to uh, identity and writing. Uh, I mean, this is around diversity and representation. So, mm. I mean, I... Uh, my identity, I, I, I think back to when I first started writing my first book about 20 years ago. And at that time, I was always aware of representation. And in particular, I was looking quite generally at the representation of women because uh, fantasy, the genre that I work in, is very rooted in mythology and folklore with some fairly horrible representations of women around uh, evil witches and, and wicked stepmothers and damsels in distress. And then the genre seemed to be morphing into the idea of, in inverted commas, strong women, which seemed to be about assigning traits typically associated with strong men. And um, so still leaning into the stereotypes and also with a very heteronormative and ableist view. So I wanted to create complex characters and challenge uh, gender stereotypes and and that kind of naturally led me into looking at intersectional identities so I write sort of heroine journeys no one gets there alone it's a combined effort of working together and everyone contributes and just like in real life in communities feel very much that diversity strengthens the cast um, I identify as a gay woman and I I think back to um, when I came out in the early 90s and some of the personal challenges um, of going against the grain of family expectation facing discrimination. Um, I was also at that time training to be a, a science teacher so I was working in schools and this was the time of section 28 and so yeah some really great challenges to go up against and uh, and very much looked for strength and solace in the LGBTQ community and received support there and, and was able to offer support there. And, and so it was a time of really learning a lot about strength in uh, togetherness and uh, strength in diversity. And I think as well, just on, a, you know, just generally those times in our lives when we have to uh, consider finding new and different paths and step outside of the unknown and and forge networks uh, with sort of new communities and learnt a lot about found families. And these are all themes that very much come into my stories. 
and very much kind of inspired my wanting to write um, sort of heroine based stories where there is a there is a diverse cast um as well in with my identity it also touches on uh, uh i have uh, issues with disability and neurodivergence um which in my case comes from uh, a critical illness five years ago so cognitive function uh changes with memory and coordination and other unusual uh, the things that I've noticed along the way, which are real benefits uh, in terms of my colour and vibrancy. I've always been quite a quite a visual writer and, and noticed that my painting and my writing has become more visual. Um, and, and mobility issues as well, and sort of facing the challenges of being disbelieved and having expectations placed on me that I can't meet and being patronised. And uh, which is what led me to go back to poetry, which I hadn't written poetry for years. And I found solace in poetry and managed to uh, forge an identity for myself as a performance poet and go around Devon. And, and again, in terms of community, that as well uh, sort of really expanded on, um, on, 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 yeah, on, on my community and being able to forge connections with people with relevant experiences to my own. So all of this stuff, uh, I think, kind of uh, teaches me a lot about community, togetherness, diversity, finding strength in togetherness, uh, needing to find new paths sometimes. And, and, and all of these, it very much goes into the kinds of uh, stories that I write. So I take a lot of inspiration from, from personal uh, experience, life experience. I don't know if you want to sort of add in anything, Lynn, about your your. Oh name. yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, no, I think um, my identity has always been uh, very um, uncertain, so uh, I don't uh, don't always not always able to sort of discuss it and so on. But I have a uh, um, slightly distorted sense of identity. I've got uh, a form of dissociative identity disorder, um, and uh, which comes from. Uh, complex PTSD and so on from uh, childhood of of uh, fun childhood experiences, um, which ends up, a lot of that gets end up, ends up written into my stories as well, because I think that um, the idea behind uh, so many famous characters know who they are, they know themselves very well. And I think for me, that has always been a, you know, almost a, an unachievable task to actually know myself know who I am you know I'm a I'm a white Kenyan um which is sort of uh, then moved to England and uh, that's a that's a very strange identity identity to have um I'm and uh, it's quite difficult to to sort of put myself into a lot of categories apart from anything because I have multiple different multiple different uh sort of identities living at once in in my experience and each one of them would consider themselves a different person and considers themselves to have a different identity so a lot of that um that uncertainty around who you are and that uh sort of it ends up getting written into my stories either as somebody who knows very firmly who they are and who feels very solidly as a particular identity whatever the identity may be or as somebody who feels isolated from the identity that other people want to put on them. So I'll sort of, so it depends how I want to feel, how whether I want to sort of explore what it might be like to having an identity you actually attach yourself to, or whether you want to um, sort of write how how I feel essentially of uh, of being slightly adrift in some ways. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've sort of, uh, one of the main reasons why that I've always wanted to write stories um, is that I've uh, growing up in Kenya, I read as a child, I read, you know, Enid Blyton books and, uh, you know, the, the 1950s British storybooks about British children growing up and having adventures. And that, that was not very relatable to me because, you know, the, the environment just wasn't particularly relatable. And I remember thinking, 
you know, I've never read a story set in Kenya. I've never read a story set in my favorite environment and the most beautiful place in the world to my mind. Uh, when I grow up, I'm going to write stories based in Kenya. And then I grew up and realized that there was a whole other issue of the very obvious fact that I'm a bit too white for all of that. So, so I have to, um, uh, I do write some stories set in Kenya, but I also now, having lived in England for 20 years, I now live, I now write a lot about England living in, in the UK. Um, but it is, uh, I have always wanted to write things that aren't seen very often. And I like to, uh, when I hear people talking about, oh, do you know what? I've never seen this in a story. I'm sort of like, oh, I'll write one for you. They go. And it's sort of that, uh, having never really had my own um, set identity and having always felt a little bit adrift in my own identity, I always want to want to sort of pepper my books with identities of, of characters, uh, characters with massively diverse identities. Yeah. Interesting that you both actually described, talked a lot about how your own experiences influence the work that you actually produce. But I'm, can I ask what, what, what was it that actually drew you towards writing in particular as a means of expressing your creativity? And, and also whether there's, there's any element of like the writing process that you find sort of like helps you to better understand your identities, if that makes sense. Honestly, I, I didn't know I was bisexual until I wrote my first novel. Um, I just thought everybody felt like, you know, everybody liked girls. <laughs> I just thought that was a standard thing. Um, and it was only when my, my friend sort of beta read my first book and said, oh, no, nobody feels like that. That's a really weird thing that they suddenly find a man attractive. You know, it's a man who finds another man attractive. People know this by this point, and I'm like, they do. So I suppose um, I've always found it a really good way of, of expressing myself and of finding my way. And I tend to find that I'm better, at, I'm better at expressing myself in written words than verbally. I tend to stumble over my words. I'm never too sure what I'm, what I'm doing when I'm speaking verbally, but it flows so much easier through writing for me. I'm 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 a bit the same. I mean, I I creativity is um the backbone of my life, I think, from being a kid. I mean, writing stories, drawing pictures, um, when I struggle to find the words to talk about things, I always look to creativity. Hence why after my illness I went straight to poetry. I found an avenue of creativity. Um, and that's just always been part of how I communicate. Um, I think that writing is uh, something that I find more and more revealing. Um, I think when we create authentically, uh, we will create something unique that's going to reveal something about ourselves. So it can be a huge learning process. I mean, I look back on some of the work that I've written and, and I can see how revealing writing can be. I sometimes think um, when we're when we're writing we might be actively aware of what we are drawing on to put into our work but I think oftentimes as well we're not always fully aware of what sort of uh, what aspects of ourself is bleeding into characters or scenes or settings or stories and that can be revealing um I I yeah I look back on some of my books and um I was kind of aware at the time, but it was only on reflection that I really saw it, uh, the, the kind of depth and, and recognised things. Uh, it's a learning process. I think uh, the, the process of writing, the process of uh, reading as well as readers, you know, we can learn a lot as, about ourselves from it. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I... And I, I we can learn a lot about the personal, but also a lot about uh, the wider world and how we relate to it and what we think about it. Um, I've learned a lot about myself. I, I, so I, 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 my, my series is, is a fantasy series and, and each book introduces a new land as the world expands. And I sort of talk about how interconnected the world is. And, um, and it's a world founded on nature and magic, which is my, my reminiscent of, of wildlife. And in there, there are patriarchal structuring, uh, governing sort of structures and, and the, the impact on the destruction of nature and the oppression of its people. And so 
themes in there around identity, uh, sort of self-discovery, and uh, you know, overall sort of looking to upturn these structures and create new visions for a future because it's all about going back to the core, which is nature and 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 magic. And I've kind of learned a lot along the way about what I actually think and what the core of this is and how I just stumbled on these themes, but how well they work. And there's a lot around compassion and and, and self-discovery and identity, no matter what that is, the more compassion we have for ourselves, the more compassion we're going to be able to give somebody else and then our wider environments and societies. And, And it kind of, it's something that, it kind of marinated only when I look back on reflection that I can see how and why, because that's the way I think. Um, but I don't think I would have been able to express that before I started. It's something that revealed itself um, through the process. So life is... And it is, it is a lot easier to be compassionate with someone else, even if that someone else is somebody you've created for a book. And in the process, we can learn to be compassionate with ourselves as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting process. Creating yeah. it's interesting. It's, it's kind of like you're 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 taking something that's very inherent inside of you and you're yes. putting it there. So then you can reflect on it from a different angle, which is interesting in itself. Definitely. Okay, so you both talked quite, I, and I I know obviously that both of you are writers who like literally are sort of like span your work spans quite a number of different genres. And um, aside from the issues that you've actually already discussed so far, are there any other themes that actually sort of like appear in your work that you you feel are important you would like to actually talk about? Um, I think uh, it's, I tend to, apart from anything, because I started writing books based in Kenya or at least heavily leaning towards a, sort of set around Kenyan Kenya or Kenyans. Mm. Uh, most of my characters in those books tended to be non-white because uh, although I'm white, I'm very much aware that I'm definitely a minority and sort of there's a very small population of uh, ex-colonials. Um, and first of all, um, I'm, I'm also used to reading books about or set in Kenya where the main characters are white. And I always found that very irritating. So when I was growing up, I thought I'm, I'm, I want to write books about Kenya so that I can show off my my beautiful country. Um, and then I was writing, actually, I, I want to write books about just regular Kenyan people. And there are so many books about white Kenyan people. So let's just let's just like even the playing field a little bit. So a lot of my characters tend to be non-white. Um, when I'm writing about characters set in England, I tend to um, sort of um, be a lot more careful because I didn't grow up in England and I know that the um, the relationship between um, race and culture in England is a very different experience to race and culture in Kenya. So I tend to be a lot more careful about when I'm writing uh, people of different cultures who have been born in England and are raised in England. So, um, but I still don't want to just turn all of my characters white because that seems very seems very reductionist, apart from anything. Um, and I also don't want all of my characters to be able-bodied just for convenience sake as well. So um, I want one of my characters, I mean, a lot of my characters have mental health issues because that's, I feel like it would be impossible for me to write a character who hasn't got mental health issues. Um, just because it feels so all-encompassing to me sometimes. Um, but also I I have um, one character who um, isn't in a book yet currently, but she is going to be in a book who is uh, going to have issues around um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, which is uh, sort of an extreme version of what I have. It doesn't affect much around the story, but it is something she deals with. And so I don't I don't really want to... Um, put it front and center but it is just something that she deals with because there are like you know thousands or millions of people who do deal with that and who live their stories and live their lives yeah Susie, I, do you have uh, anything uh just uh yeah i mean uh, similar lena i mean just thinking about representation i mean when i when i started writing i mean i i write uh 
I like worlds and so it's got to be populated and so I want to see something that feels like it's reflective of societies and I create different lands and those lands there are different cultures and societies in the landscapes that I create so I want it to feel uh, reflective of, of the world in terms of diversity because otherwise it's if there's no diversity it's not reflective of the world. I um I started life as a science teacher and then moved into teaching English as a foreign language. So I was um I moved out to North Africa in the Sudan and then I moved down to South Africa for quite a while, and and it was there that I really started writing. So the inspirations for a lot of the backdrops became as a bit of a contrast between North Africa and South Africa with bushlands and deserts, and that kind of formed the backdrop environmental theme. Um. And and similarly, Lynn, you know, this is a world that expands, and so uh, not everybody's white, um, dependent on the landscapes. Um, and I'm very broadly in terms of representation. I was very aware that I'd known a lot of people from very different backgrounds, dealing with very different things. And one of the things I kind of and people that came to mean an awful lot to me. And one of the things in terms of representation was, you know, thinking that I'd like people. You know, if they were to read this book, they would see something that uh, felt was representative for them, something that they could directly relate to. So in terms of story arcs and uh, the character backdrops and, uh, yeah, representation being broad life, not just the, 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 the more obvious sort of boxes that we look for, but just broad life representation. Um so and 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 similarly in in terms of sort of queer representation my i mean i'm i'm gay so my main characters are unsurprisingly predominantly gay women because kind of why wouldn't they be but there is you know <laughs> there are other people going on as well mm -hmm. um and and also looking at the binaries by the time i get to my third book that i'm currently working on you know challenging the sort of binary thinking in terms of gender um, it was very important to me that mental health and disability was uh, reflected because that is only uh, you you can't reflect societies if you don't have various different abilities. Um, and uh, and yeah, so I've got some key storylines um, in terms of uh, I mean, mental health comes up quite significantly for two characters in particular and and how their their perspective and their view of the world informs their story arc. And again, that sort of coming together of people helping one another um, and physical disability. I'm working on a character at the moment in my third book, who is one of my main characters that I'm really excited about. Um, so yeah, in th that sort of broad scope representation is really key and, and you know, the kind of life experiences that we have and the more people we come across. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very, very keen, right from the beginning, very, very keen that this wasn't going to look like a hero story, you know, that it was going to be challenging the moles, challenging expectations. And uh, yeah, I like people can see themselves as heroes and heroines, regardless of backdrops. I did that thing where I actually muted myself. I'm so glad I actually remembered that before I started speaking again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the comedy element of today's talk, by the way. So, um, so I'm guessing. So, as as writers, obviously, you're both inherently aware of the the sort of the responsibility you both have, actually, in terms of like shaping people's perceptions and understanding the world through your writing, and obviously the responsibility that comes with that. Um, so, so how do, how do you ensure, um, you, you know, that you, first of all, that you are mindful of that responsibility? And also, I guess, what do you hope that your readers will take away from your work that would actually maybe help to sort of like shape and sort of like inform their own understanding of the world? If that's the question. <laughs> um, I hope that, uh, that people can people would learn to be kind um i think it's it's sort of it is like you said very much something that uh that i'm aware of in because you know about how much books have raised me in as as a child as a, a young adult and as a you know as a 
20, 30 year old and changing in, in my own life, um, how much of an impact books have had to me and, and how important they've been to me. Um, I think that it is a massive responsibility. Obviously, at the same time, I don't expect to change the world, but if I can change one person, one person and like in a good way, then that's great. Um, so if I, so I think that I would want, I always want all of my characters to be at the root of it kind. Um, they may not always be nice. They may be really grumpy and they may start off not particularly kind. One of my one of my characters, uh, in fact, the first book I got published with Bold Strokes, the main character isn't nice and she isn't particularly kind to start with. But that is her arc is learning to think outside of her own mind and to look at other people and to care about other people um, more beyond beyond the sort of uh you know don't say rude things to them to you know to actually care about um about your actions and the impact that your actions and your words have on someone um so i think that even if the characters are not um are not nice or not uh not necessarily kind to everybody at least if they can be kind to um kind to the people who need it the most or if they can be kind to themselves or if they can be kind to at least some people I think I would like I would like um if one one message ever got me to kind be kind to people which is really naff but I don't care I think it's lovely <laughs> naff at all oh thanks <laughs> um I would um I mean I think one of the things I'm a, I'm quite a visual writer. Um, I like color. Um, one of the one of the motivations to write and create art and create any kind of writing or or creative work is to just put some color into the world, um, because uh, it it's it's enjoyable to uh to read books and tell stories and you know, uh, so just for that 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 factor of some light relief and some escapism and just to have a good time and enjoy and just just feel the color. But in but also in terms of the messages, um, I write a lot about identity and and uh, self discovery and self belief and empowerment. These are things that all my characters kind of go through, and um, and within that as well, sort of in the, the bigger arc of the of the series as a whole, um, perspective change, and it's just that kind of. Uh, and 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 sort of challenging the binaries and trying to promote the non-judgmental aspect of things and the fact that you know we we might think that we know something but sometimes a little bit of flexibility can go a long way to just be able to be flexible to change in our minds to learning to um to being adaptable to growing these are good personal traits to help mm -hmm. with problem solving and so my characters go through these kinds of things. Some of them look like quite unreliable narrators at time. It's what they think they know at the time, but they don't necessarily have all the information. And so that kind of, that's something that's important to me. I can certainly look back on my life and see times where I was so sure I knew something. And then, okay, just you just need to keep learning, keep listening. And uh, which is why the diverse casts are really strengthening, because we learn a lot from each other and from all of our very different experiences. And so I think I think that's not a bad message to try to put out there if that do, if that is what comes across. But also, yeah, and it is fun mm -hmm. to write an unreliable narrator. Yes, mm -hmm. my whole first book is an unreliable narrator and she has a great time. <laughs> Um, but also just as well just talking a little bit about that yeah that responsibility of um representation and and the responsibility in particular of writing outside of your own direct personal experience mm -hmm. and that's where uh yeah sensitivity readers come in and um yeah we have to i mean i i, I think there's real value in own voices and people sort of really exploring their own experiences because it's really good uh, good for all of us to be able to learn from those voices but also as fiction writers uh, we do have to be able to imagine outside of our own experience because that's kind of the point but when we do that we have to be really responsible on how we're approaching that I mean you're definitely going to get um, 
you'll definitely get the feedback in reviews. So if you get it wrong, you're going to know about it. But I mean, I mean, I'm I'm a gay woman, and I had some feedback in my first book writing a gay woman, and it's like, oh, I think I need to go away and think about that. And that was actually my own experience. Yeah, yeah. Now um, I've got a. a uh, one character in particular I'm writing at the moment, a, a woman with significant uh, physical disabilities. I'm definitely going to be doing a lot of work with mm-hmm. around that. I feel really passionate about incorporating the story, but I feel a huge responsibility in, in doing that as well. Yeah. And I do, I'm I'm lucky to, uh, I write a lot of fan fiction because that's, uh, it's just fun. Um, and I think that uh, it's very it's very easy to get into, um, you know, it's it's a great opportunity to really inject um, a bit more diversity and a bit more um, like different lived experiences in stories that everybody knows. And, <clears throat> and I think it's also a great way of talking with people from a massively diverse background because everybody who comments is sort of like, oh yeah, no, I've had experience with this exact thing that you're writing, and you're like, "Oh boy, please tell me I did it okay." You know, and so it's a really good opportunity to talk to people um, who have that lived experience. And like you said, it we do have to try and write outside of our own immediate experience. Otherwise, we would just literally be writing stories about, um, you know people who used to be science teachers who are now, not, who are now writers and, and sapping women. I writing. used to be a science teacher too. <laughs> so, um, but it's it's sort of, you know, you can extrapolate from your own experiences. Um, so, for example, I if you want to write about uh, visiting the Arctic, you know, I've never visited the Arctic. I have um been a person dumped in a very very cold place for the first time in my life and realized that I was woefully unprepared for it because I did not realize mm. how cold Yorkshire gets having grown up in 30 degree heat I was not prepared for how cold it gets in Yorkshire in, in October so it's sort of that taking that and obviously it's not the Arctic but it is something you can take that in that deep bone deep cold where it's so cold you want to cry and think I wonder if a British person going to the Arctic feels a bit like that. And so just sort of on that very silly example, taking something and and uh, ex- expanding on it. Yeah. Interesting how you both mentioned that there's sort of the obvious you need as a writer to actually be able to sort of like write about experiences that are outside of your own experience. But I imagine that one of the challenges actually of being a writer is is basically to sort of like not in, in doing so. I uh, mean, you know, particularly just creating diverse characters, characters, for instance, for instance, you don't have the direct experience to inform their development. Is to ensure that you're not perhaps sort of like perpetuating like stereotypes or yes. particularly harmful representations. And I'm wondering, do do either of you have any sort of like advice or experience for listeners in how to sort of like balance those two? sort of like those two issues of being a, having to write about outside your own experience, but again, not perpetuating any damaging or harmful stereotypes. Listen, like really listen to other people. If they say something's a harmful stereotype, really listen, because you don't know, you know, you might think that it's like, it's like when somebody, uh, somebody says, oh, but I didn't mean that by it, or I didn't mean something by how I said it. That doesn't matter. It's how it came across and how it was said that that matters a lot. So if some, if you, um, if you want to write about somebody from, I don't know, um, you know, if you want to write somebody from um, Ohio. I've never been to America. I've never been to Ohio. I've never met anybody from Ohio. Um, so if you want to write about somebody from that area, you've got to know specifically um, about people who do live in that area. What do they have to deal with? You know, uh, maybe go beyond a very obvious Google of finding a place name, uh, have a look on uh, forums online. So find the local uh, Reddit site reddit can always be a bit of a a bit of a cesspool to to explore and so on but if you um if you curate your experience and use the block button judiciously then you should be fine 
um, you know, explore places where people talk about their own lived experience, go and visit the sort of Ohio subreddit or something and see what people are talking about, what they uh, what they discuss. Find somebody, you know, make a post on this subreddit and say, I need a, a sensitivity reader from this particular community. Is that OK? Am I allowed to ask? Is the, um, is this is there anything I should avoid? Is there anything um, you would like to see better represented and so on? So I'm using Ohio as a very obvious, um, as a as a rather surface level thing, but I'm sure that there are issues that people in Ohio live with that they would rather were represented better in media when somebody says X, Y, Z person is from Ohio, what stereotypes come up? What do people think? And um, what would they rather people stop thinking? So listen, I guess, is my major, major thing. Listen to people who do have that lived experience. Just to move the conversation on a, a little bit because I think we we are mindful of the time. Um, I'm also just wondering: just, has uh, have have a couple of people disappeared? Like, has the Zoom? I think the Zoom is still going strong. We're still in conversation. Susie, I think, has maybe just dropped out for a second. Okay, but hopefully, we'll be rejoining. Um, so we'll, we'll continue. Uh, um, yeah, where where do you? I'm interested in learning more about your own sort of like. Uh, influences your own sort of like you know what inspires you where you sort of draw your inspiration from as a writer massive amounts of daydreaming and um sort of it's uh, it's very weird the the pathways that i can watch my brain taking as they as they come up with ideas um, a lot of them I can't uh, I can't really remember where a particular concept came from. But one of the thing, one of the stories that I'm um, percolating away in the back of my head, which I won't write for some time, um, mm -hmm. is based on my great grandfather's experience um, as a, an amputee from World War One. Um, he was offered the opportunity to buy some land in Kenya and um, went to Kenya for some reason couldn't get to his farm in any other way other than to take a donkey and walk and ride a donkey all the way from Mombasa to this farm a couple of hundred miles away. And uh, so, you know, it's sort of this, this very interesting experience. But from that family history, I am now planning to write a story about space-faring um, uh, 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 characters who are one character moving to another planet and hanging out with uh, another alien character that she falls in love with and uh, they travel around on boats and stop the building of a new hotel by some sort of monopoly and inter intergalactic conglomerate. So I don't know quite how I got there from my family history, but I do know that it was a major key in guessing to that point it was uh, the characters in my head make perfect sense but I'm not sure how I got from A to B because it just sort of percolated in my head and uh, and turned into something very very different that I'm not sure I can I know what the source was I just don't know how I got there <laughs> well thank you Ellen and uh, I think Susie can come come back and then it's just as sort of like as a quick technical issue oh, yes um, so. and um so which uh, if i'm if i may, may i if i may ask um oh sorry could you could you say again please here sorry my earpiece fell out <laughs> So, could you repeat the question please i said i said, I said are there any writers in particular that inspire you um i think terry pratchett has always inspired me massively i love the the way that he writes and i love the way he subverts expectations um and uh it's almost sort of like his uh his world and the the world that he's created the disc world in particular you can follow along with um how he starts in a very stereotypically um you know 
high fantasy, obvi very obviously based on Tolkien's work, who I also love. Um, and the way that then gets, I love his subversion of expectations from the very beginning, but that then as he grew as a writer and as his, uh, his ideas and his listening to other people from other communities developed as he was exposed to other communities and so on, as he listened to people, how his characters changed and how his characters developed and you know the um the, the presence of cheery the dwarf of cherry the dwarf and so on as she um just sort of finds her goes on her gender identity journey and stuff like that and none of it is treated as a joke they are all treated as actual people and the stories are incredibly funny but the people are not treated as a joke their identities are not a joke. The things they say are very funny, but their identities are never treated as a, as a, as a laughing point. And I think um, it sounds very silly because I don't often write high fantasy or anything like that, but I do find that the way humanity and the way that he writes people and the way that he very obviously cares for people, I think is um, has always been very important to me. Oh, uh, the sound isn't working. Because I've muted myself. <laughs> I was getting emails popping through. Um, um, aside from obviously writing literature, um, are there any other art forms that actually inspire you that you sort of like literally, that you maybe incorporate themes of? Um, yeah, I, I have... Um... I have a lot of hobbies and most of them are arty and creative and some of them are, you know, a bit silly and, and just sort of uh, fluffy at the moment. I've got to keep my hands busy because otherwise I would be fiddling with my fingers, as you can see. To keep my hands busy on my lap, I have a small blanket because I like to crochet stuff. Um, I like to take photographs with an old black and white film camera. And a lot of those kinds of things do end up making their way into the stories just as like spice or flavoring, um, because now I know how to um, develop film and I learned how to use a proper old fashioned camera and so on. One of the characters that I'm currently writing is a photographer and I spent quite some time um, hassling, bless him, he was very patient with me, hassling a professional photographer and saying, so how did you deal with COVID as a concept? Um, you know, because the, my character uh, is a photographer dealing with ideas of uh, dealing with the problem of isolation and uh, and, and so on in, in co during COVID and uh, so on. But a lot of the things that I end up doing, the sort of different things that I poke my nose into, I tend to be sort of a jack of all trades and master of none type thing. I, I end up poking my nose into a bunch of different areas, getting fascinated by something. And then it ends up in a story in an unexpected way. So I used to be an avid scuba diver and my, um, my most recent book, Drifting, is about mermaids. A lot of that ends up, a lot of the scuba diving stuff that I know has ended up in drifting. Um, particular which a lot of the stuff because I was scuba diving from such a young age I didn't realize was unknown but the fact that you can't scuba dive below sort of like you know 300 meters under underwater and uh or you can't without specialist equipment and, and that kind of thing so a lot of that ended up in in the story and uh surprised my editor so like I'm sorry the wreck moves it moves why is it moving like because of waves and tides and stuff um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of random creative stuff, and of course Susie is a uh, is a poet and a, an artist. So for her, that would be a major. I can imagine would be a massive influence on what she produces and what she, her writing brings up. Well, ho hopefully she'll get the chance to join back yes. again. But hope just technical issues and and basically to tell us more about her uh, her own sort of like work as a visual artist and also as a yes. poet. Um, but for you, Lynn, I mean, I, I'm always intrigued by the the the, 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 
you know, the craft of, if you can call it that, craft of storytelling mm -hmm. and, and how and how it begins really in, in, in essence. And for you, where, where, where is your starting point? Where do you, where do you begin to sort of like, you know, construct your own narratives? I think um, um, where... could be, it's the, the initial spark of inspiration can be anywhere. Um, I've literally, I've had um, sort of, the story I'm writing at the moment called Changeling is about um, fairies of the old fashioned kind, you know, the, the kind that humans consider dangerous and, and terrifying and slightly evil. Um, and or not so much evil, but so uh, unknowable and very dangerous. Um, and so for that, I was influenced a lot by the fairy stories that I read, the old folk tales that I read as a child. And, um, you know, there's uh, there's things like uh, just lying in the grass on a on a summer evening or something playing with my kids one of my stories came about by watching my children um pretend to be percy jackson characters in an old ruined viaduct and uh that, then on the walk home i was sort of in my head formulating this idea of uh of the ancient creatures who can control the, the weather or something like that it, it turned into controlling the magnetosphere um, and the northern lights and so on, it got very weird. Um, but the idea, um, I think the actual uh, development of a story as it is, those ideas have to spend quite a little bit of time percolating and fizzing around in my brain until they slot themselves into a plot. And one thing that I found incredibly useful, and I know you wanted to talk a bit about the, the actual process of writing and, and advice and so on, I really recommend a book called Save the Cat Writes a Novel. A lot of people might already know about it. Um, Save the Cat is basically a, um, it was originally designed for screenwriting. And it's basically where uh, if you want to make your character likable, even if they are unpleasant person pre-arc, you know, pre their character arc, make sure they do something that makes you want to root for them, make them save the cat. And um, so that phrase that was used in screenwriting has now percolated through to other areas. And there's a book called Save the Cat Writes a Novel, which helps to describe uh, story structure. And when I was first, when I first started out writing, I didn't like the idea of having a particular structure that I had to stick to because I don't particularly like rules. And I also thought, you know, life doesn't stick to stories. Why should my books? I'm writing about, I want them to be realistic. I don't want to stick to a bunch of rules. However, we're not writing realism. We're not like, if you want to be a, a you know, a, a very uh, proper literary fiction writer, then sometimes realism is the, is the road you want to go down. But literary fiction is a whole genre that works on breaking every rule. And, um, and that's great, but you have to know what the rules are first before you can break them. And so with novels, you can break all the rules, but you have to know what the rules are first, because um, the way that we interact with stories and the way that we love stories and the reason that we love stories is because we know to a certain extent what's coming. We need to have the rhythm of it. We need to have like music. We need to have things are only pleasing in certain combinations of notes. Um, and that's why, to a certain extent, songs can flow into each other. Um, it's the same with writing and with stories, is we need to know, uh, we need to have particular rhythm to the story. It needs to have a beginning, a middle, and the end. It needs to have um, some sort of struggle for the characters to overcome. So that book is really helpful uh, because it really lays it out. And once you know the rules, if you really want to, you can break them. Or if you want to, you can just do that. So I really recommend that one. Um, it's possible, indeed. I hope it is that there might be many people here today who um, who have aspirations of becoming writers, writers themselves. I mean, do you have any do you have any advice for them um, in terms of in, in terms of actually sort of like approaching publishing, actually getting their work published? Um, the um, best piece of advice about actually approaching publishers is you can do it two ways. You can either approach mm. the publisher themselves, make sure 
that uh, like have a look at the publisher online, look at their mm -hmm. website first. Um, you can usually tell if a publisher is like a um, what's called a vanity publisher if they ask you for money. If they're asking you to pay them to publish your book, the answer is no. You do not pay people to publish your book. Um, if you are self-publishing, that's a different matter. But if you are being published, if someone says, I like your story, I want to write it, I want to publish it, then they give you money. It should never be the other way around. And pe because people get scammed really cruelly out of their money. And I've had I've had um, uh, things like that uh, coming through where they've they've tried to get me to pay them to publish things. So, but the, the flow of money, the, the flow of money is to the author because authors are broke. Um, we, you know, the, the publisher regains the money from the sales of the book. They do not get the, the writer to pay them to publish the book. So don't fall into the trap of paying someone up front to publish your book. Um, if you are going to submit, uh, if you're going to query authors, uh, sorry, to query publishers and or agents, um, find out their expectations online. Everyone who has open submissions will have a list of guidelines. Have your first three chapters or your first whatever, you know, 500 words, they will have different things that they expect. Always read what their submissions criteria are because different ones will have different rules and you will probably have to change your submission every single time. You can't really just have a stock submission that you hand out to everyone, but you can have a basic um, covering letter that you use and only change the beginning and the end. Like, you know, make sure you find a person's name to direct it to. Make sure you find um, what their criteria are. Make sure you have a look at what other authors they represent and say, oh, I'm a big fan of this particular author or I love the fact that you um, that you like to shine a spotlight on um, on, uh, on voices in disability or I like the fact that um, your agents like to uh, give, a, give a, a platform to um, queer authors, that kind of thing. So find something they've done and show that you've show that you've read their stuff, but don't spend too much time on it because the second piece of advice is pro is query everybody. Like just send message, send things to everyone who has their submissions open. Don't bother if they don't because they won't look at it. If if someone has their submissions open, send it to everyone. Um and don't expect an answer because 90% of them won't send an answer. Um, just, you have to be, you have to almost not care. <laughs> so um, in terms of getting getting published in a traditional sense, mm. just send it and then forget about it. Pretend you haven't sent it. Just be like, oh, I don't know what I did yesterday. Literally gas your light, gaslight yourself into not, into forgetting about it completely. And then if you get a reply, that's nice. If you don't get a reply, what message? I didn't send them a message. I didn't query them. Just you'd have to not care about it because they won't all answer. <laughs> um, can you think of any any support that might be available from sort of like organisations or advocacy groups to sort of like help sort of like uh, writers, potential writers from diverse backgrounds to sort of like get get their work published. I, uh, the GCLS is great in terms of um, particularly sapphic author, Golden Crown Literary Society, great in terms of sapphic authors. Other than that, I'm disappointed to say that I don't. I can't think of um, any sort of organisations or groups, or I personally don't know of any. I personally haven't come across any. So unfortunately, I don't have specific groups that I can recommend. However, having a look and, you know, having a having a search on Reddit, Discord, um, uh, even Facebook to a certain extent, if that's your area, if that's your if that's the thing that you like, then uh, something like that could be really helpful. Um, I personally haven't found any, but the GCLS, uh, other than the GCLS, which is very supportive of um, sapphic writers. And ooh, oh, I am actually speaking. So um, 
I know you have an awful lot of experience actually as uh, as well as actually having work that's actually published in a traditional sense, but also I've also sort of like literally in, in terms of self-publishing. So, which has become obviously incredibly popular in recent years. And, you know, and I think many authors have chosen to sort of go down this route. So I, I perhaps, mm -hmm. in you know, had a choice. Um, um, so um, can you, can you discuss perhaps the, the pros and cons yeah. of this route? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the um, I uh, I think that it definitely, obviously, has the the massive disadvantage of it's all centered around Amazon, and I don't particularly like Amazon. However, it is the it's practically the only way you're going to get get your stuff out there to a wider audience. Um, but it is also very good. Um, you've got the option of print on demand, which basically means that there's no outlay, no large outlay of funds initially when you want to get a, a large number of copies. You don't have to get uh, you don't have to get a certain number of copies that are then printed. They won't give you a minimum number of copies. That you, can print. you can just get a single copy one at a time. Um, a, a buyer who wants to buy a copy of your book, either they'll buy the ebook, which is the most common way of it being sold or they can get a paperback book, just one copy of a paperback book printed immediately for them and shipped to them. Um, so there is certainly a, a convenience aspect to it. There's also the aspect that a lot of the time when you're um, querying uh, agents and publishers, you're not necessarily going to get a re response. Um, and so for me, I was constantly querying publishers and I was going through the process of self-publishing at the same time. Um, and uh, it's sort of, uh, it means that I can take a little bit of time over my um, my neatening up my book, editing it, making sure it's typeset correctly. Um, I, oh my gosh, what was the website I used for typesetting? Um, I'm so sorry, I can't remember the name of the website that I used to typeset my work. Um, there's, uh, there is the Kindle, um, the Kindle Direct stuff does have some sources for you to use, but I did use an excellent website and I've now completely forgotten its name. Um, the, uh, the, I think there are loads of options for people that you can pay to edit your book. Um, I personally didn't because broke um so I, I had no money um but uh you can also make your own book covers you can pay someone to make your book covers for you or you can make your own using canva and uh buying a uh buying a stock image for example um so it's it is something that you can essentially do free to play um, so it is it is something that you can spend no money on whatsoever or you can spend a large amount of money and get it much more polished. Um, I made the mistake of not checking through my typesetting well enough in my in my second book and ended up with a chapter uh, replicated. So uh, one chapter was written in there twice and I was missing a chapter from there. Uh, so uh, one of my books I had to quickly pull down off Amazon and replace with it better copy um so you do have a lot more the disadvantage is nobody professional is doing it for you unless you pay them the advantage is that you have complete creative control over everything that you do and that you can do it at your own pace at your own time and uh, you don't have to listen to anybody telling you that um oh you should make sure that this character does this because um uh, we don't want to we don't want to risk uh, upsetting a particular uh, upsetting a particular politician you know i can i can mention um i can mention a politician by name and and uh, they and nobody can tell me not to there is a disadvantage to that you can get you can get in trouble from the politician directly so uh, maybe don't mention politicians by name um hey susie's back oh brilliant Oh. Hi everyone. Thank you. So, oh, Hi. so glad. Goodness me. <laughs> um, I have no idea what happened. It all just went down. 
and I tried logging on on other devices and nothing was working. So, um, so I'm really sorry about that. It's never happened before on this computer. No, no, we were you, you, we were talking earlier about other influences, um, Susie. Yes. So, if there was anything you wanted, so we mentioned in particular, for instance, uh, if there were any writers in particular who inspire you. Um, and also as well for um, whether um, you, you and I know you do is the answer to this question partly but I mean I'd give you a chance to talk about yourself is whether you sort of like draw inspiration from other you know forms of arts like even and as a, as a poet and also as a visual artist I imagine you have a broad sort of like sort of like field of inspiration um I have, yeah, inspiration from, from lots of places. I mean, working in sci-fi fantasy, I find uh, the writing community to be a really exciting and inspiring place in itself. Mm. Uh, so I um, am a member of the British Fantasy Society, the British Science Fiction Association, and um, and and sort of attend conventions and, and speak on panels about different stuff. And thousands of people are sort of involved and... Um, and so there's a massive cross section of the community that you're sort of tapping into and, and listening to different and very broad experiences. And um, and there's a lot of really interesting work coming out of that um, around diversity, and rep you know, inclusive diversity and representation. Um, there's some really interesting work out there. Um, there's, uh, yeah, in terms of queer representation, uh, loads of, of great examples. There's lots of epic fantasy with uh, sapphic main characters and sapphic sort of romances at the centre with uh, stories like The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri, uh, which is an Indian-inspired novel. Um, there's some really interesting work coming out around challenging the binary. So um, uh, the Singing Hills Cycle by Ingi Vo with a, a non-binary uh, cleric as a main character. And this is kind of fantasy around uh, sort of reminiscent of Imperial China. There's some really interesting intersections as well. There's a gorgeous uh, graphic uh, novel called The Magic Fish. And it's about um, a young lad in the States and uh, living with his Vietnamese family who are uh, refugees and he doesn't have the Vietnamese to come out to his family as gay and so they find a common language through fairy tales and and this is just beautifully uh, drawn book. Uh, River Solomon does some really interesting intersections around neurodivergence and uh, sort of non-conforming gender characters set against some really interesting um, backdrops uh, and unkindness of ghosts is a really interesting story uh, sci-fi on board a generation ship organized like the antebellum south and so kind of really interesting example about how stories can sort of hold a lens up to uh, take a step back and reflect on the sort of past and presence and some of the, the sort of devastating racism at that time um, but with a main character as well who is uh, non-conforming gender and reads as autistic and so um, really interesting characterization um, yeah, loads. Uh, Nadia Korofor is a really interesting author for me. Um, she writes uh, African futurism and African Jujuism. Um, so sci-fi fantasy based in various places around Africa. And uh, she wrote a book, uh, a novella recently called Nua, which is the, the, uh, the name of the main character who has significant physical disabilities and um, a really empowered character that leads us through this really inventive story um, around sort of a uh, huge amount of agency and and uh, is, is, is into mechanics and cybernetics and is motivated to sort of move through the world on her own terms. And, and that author as well, find, I find her really inspiring just on a personal level uh, with her own experience of disability. Um, and she wrote a, an autobiographical novella, which I found really emotional to read and really relatable for me to read. Um, so there's huge amounts of work out there to sort of draw on and um, and and be inspired by. Um, and I try and do a lot, sort of, I read around the genre. And um, just something what we were saying earlier about 
sort of uh, own voices and when we're writing outside of our own uh, personal experiences and using kind of um, sensitivity readers and um, sort of looking at our own frame of reference to to get it right um, is is kind of you know spending time with community is spending time with people and checking out our own motivation and intention for why we're wanting to write those those character arcs um and the you know these sort of big writing communities you come into contact with a lot of people and there's a lot of scope for for um for learning a lot and for finding you know sort of uh crossing over stories and checking each other out and and um yeah there's there's a lot of interesting stuff coming out um, and I and I often feel like some of the diverse representations are not getting as much uh, attention as they perhaps uh, deserve. Um, and so, sort of, when I do it, when I read around the genre, I try and review where I can, and um, uh, in terms of doing what I can to sort of raise awareness of of in particular of own voice experiences, because uh, there is some really interesting work. So hopefully, over time, they'll get more. Uh, get more airtime and they'll reach more readers. Thank you and also before you uh it's just to recap as well as we were just also talking about for instance because it's, it's very possible that there may well be some in, uh, aspiring writers here today listening to this conversation and wonder whether you have any advice for them in actually sort of like beginning their careers and sort of like ne negotiating the journey towards getting their you know getting their work into publishing and maybe any sort of like organisations that can help with that or even advocacy groups that exist to sort of like, particularly to help aspiring writers from diverse backgrounds to sort of like bring their, their work to sort of like an, in an audience. I mean, I'd say just start writing. I mean, first of all, I, I, I guess it depends what form of writing you're wanting to mm. do. Mm. Um, but, um, start writing make a start uh you need to find your own voice and your own style and your own groove um write what you're interested in read around uh and enjoy the process i, I think i think to start with is um i would suggest and um, unless you're sort of doing something more specific like journalism but with writing books or short stories is just start writing and start building up a body of work and not necessarily focusing too much on the outcome to start with, but just to enjoy the process and um, and stick to what you know and, and, and read around that and learn. Um, if you're kind of struggling to stay with the motivation, take a break and, and, and refresh. Uh, you can switch up and try, uh, try writing something of a slightly different form, like a book review or an article, just to keep your keep you flowing um and 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 that understanding from the beginning that writing is rewriting so whatever you write there is going to be a long editing process this is not you know things don't happen quickly it takes work and patience and editing and and it's all a learning process much editing yeah so much editing so much editing <laughs> which i mean you 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 come to enjoy the edits in yes. my experience you do come to enjoy the edits um but yeah, and everything that's in there is, you know, there's the kind of classics where they say like, show, sure, don't tell, and don't give your information dumps. Everything that's in the story needs to move the story on in some way and reveal something to us. Um, so yeah, there are, there are so many things that I've written. I know about my characters, but it never came up in the story. So I can't write it. No, <laughs> It's not relevant to the story. Therefore it has to stay in my head. Yeah. So, so I mean, I mean, it's got to have pace, and 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 you want to keep your readers engaged. So, there's lots of different sort of things around the the process of writing, and I would say just start writing and get some work down. Um, and once you've got a body of work, then you can start to think about what those next steps might be. And uh, you know, if you're looking to get a book or something published, you know where you might go, what you might think, and 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 what what you're wanting to get out of that process. Um, some people can find sort of writing groups, generic writing groups, uh, good for sort of motivation and sharing and swapping ideas. Um, and, and in terms of sort of diverse representation, um, 
um, it's some groups kind of come and go. So back along during COVID, I stumbled on an online sapphic writers group, which I really loved at the time. We were doing a lot of poetry and open mics and they had an online magazine and I uh, got a few things published with them, but they did close down. But that was just from Googling at the time and, and doing a bit of research at the time. Out on the Page is a good one for queer writers that are still going. And um, they've run, they're sort of uh, British based, but they're also expanding out internationally. And they run regular writers cafes online and also in-person events. And they run workshops and, and networking sort of events. And they're good at sort of giving ideas of where you might go uh, with different forms of writing, give sort of, yeah, chances to read out work. If you're writing, I would say, find opportunities to read your work out loud to people because you'll get feedback. Um, and and I, in terms of disability, I did have a quick look round before I came on uh, specifically. So the Society of Authors, there is a, uh, I think she's called Claire Wade, um, but you'd have to be an author already with it, but there is a forum within the Society, Society of Authors that specifically um, is as a support for people with uh, disabilities and chronic health issues. And I did also just stumble across another one, disabledwriters.com. Um, and those are specific for people who are journalists or who are aspiring journalists. And it's kind of a database where you can register and there's a, they're, they're kind of trying to support people to find paid work opportunities. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there are things if, if you can have a look around. I've also found that um, for queer authors, once you've got your stuff out, once you have written and pub, and you know, self-published or published, uh, it is amazing how much you can, how much sort of, uh, uh, how much fun you can have going to pride events and going to local, um, local sort of lit fests nearby. Um, and those I, I've got to be honest, I've found most of them just through simply Googling my particular area and Pride events or Pride calendar or going on to Facebook, because although I'm not I'm not much of a I'm not much one for, for enjoying Facebook as a social social media site, it is incredibly useful for events. Um, and so and Pride, Pride events are very often heavily uh, marketed on Facebook. So I would recommend having a look on there and seeing if you can find um, a local event that you want to join in with and it's you meet some amazing people and I really recommend it as a as an option once you have a book once you're ready to go so and they're usually quite open to self-published authors as well brilliant thank you both um I'm not sure whether there is an, I'm going to ask this question anyway because obviously I think we all agree we'd like to see more people from diverse backgrounds mm. actually get into publishing because that will create the sort of the kind of nuanced sort of like characters that we all need to see and read more about. And I wonder if there may not be an answer to this question, but I mean, what steps do you think, if any, the sort of like the, the you know, the publishing industry would be able to take to sort of like to, you know, in order to become, you know, more inclusive and accessible for writers from diverse backgrounds? uh promote diverse uh diverse uh people in every level of the of the process so you know we need more diverse publishers we need, need more diverse agents um so i think just as a sort of immediate thing there needs to be um <coughs> something um in some sort of uh sort of positive uh, process by which they encourage people who are working at every level of the publishing industry um, and uh, and that obviously is something that takes time but there are also people who are already in the publishing industry who have got their own diverse backgrounds and as such would um, you know they should be given more of a platform within their own within their work um, they will have specific areas where they are um, sort of more experienced and have more um, have more understanding, have more uh, experience, lived experience there. Um, so, yes, I think that's got to be um, part of the story because uh, they are the ones who get to make the decisions about what books come out. Um, so it's got to be... Uh, 
not just encouraging people from diverse backgrounds to write books, which is also another major thing, which I think should be, you know, if there could be outreach programs and so on for, for people from a bunch of different backgrounds to actually write their experiences and get some um, some sort of encouragement and help to write their, their experiences, but also making sure that within the publishing industry that it is uh, something that uh, is encouraged and um, uh, diversity should be part of the, the process of hiring people and promoting people and so on. I don't have any say in that because I have nothing to do with the publishing industry, but that's what I think they should do. <laughs> I, this is an opportunity, I think, if they're listening to take on board those, those you know, really well-informed comments there, Lynn. Susie, do you have anything to add? I would just, I think I would just, uh, I was just sort of thinking about, because, you know, in terms of publishing, we've got like the big publishing houses and then there's the small presses and there's quite a difference. And I think, so from from some of the main publish that you know, the biggest ones like Penguin and and, and uh, HarperCollins and so on, I think the, the big publishing companies are very financially driven. And so they don't need to take risk on new authors. And so I think as a new author, they're, particularly difficult to get into but small press is not so much because I think I mean I I am with a small press and I come across a few other small presses in the sci-fi conventions I go to and there I often I mean I've met a lot and they, they generally seem to be quite ethically driven and and uh, you know because they have their own sort of uh, relationship with with these kind of diverse issues um so they are kind of taking on authors. So if you're if you are from a diverse background, it's definitely not going to stand against you. That small presses do take on, 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 and and are very interested in doing so. And I think actually a lot of the readers and writers really push that. Uh, when you know all the panels that get spoken about at these conventions really pushing for that's what people want. That's what people want in the stories that they're buying. And so small presses are listening to that, but they don't have. The revenue for advertising so books by small presses and you're not going to see them hit your screens because they're not they, they just don't have the money for that sort of a marketing like the big publishing companies do but they're the big publishing companies they're they're, they're, they're they are taking on the you know the more popular names already and then i also think about like you know like the film industry a few years ago, I did a really rudimentary, crude, quick search on what stories were in publication. Most of the books on my shelves are by small uh, small presses. And, and that, that I look for those kind of diverse ranges in what I'm reading. And I also want to try and promote the own voices. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm looking to read. Um, but when I looked on this, the, the majority of the, the stories, I mean, to start with, just very crudely, it was only about 20% women and the rest were men. So then when you start to think about further intersections, it's just getting more and more limited. And a lot of the films, they're not coming out. The productions aren't coming from the newer stories. They're coming from the older stories. So we really just need to catch up. Um, and this is the kind of, you know, I think for a lot of people, when they think about what stories are out there, they're, they're, this, they're looking at the ones that are the most visible but they're the ones with the most revenue behind. So I'm not quite sure what the answer is, just to keep putting pressure on these big companies to say, you know, you need to be taking more chances and you need to be putting some financial backing behind some of these because there are tons of, of, of amazing stories out there from really diverse representative backgrounds. Um, and there's more coming out all the time. Um, but whether or not we hear about them is, is another matter. Uh, that's kind of my view on that at the moment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, our um, obviously, I think I we're with the same publisher, um, and uh, there it's a very, very small. It's a relatively small indie publisher, and uh, obviously they have a massive effort to encourage diversity. And there's always calls within, um, you know, on the business list and so on, asking for uh, is anybody has anybody got any. Um, any books, uh, sort of own voices specifically, or is there anybody who wants to um, sort of join and write an anthology about gender and about from non-binary non voices and that kind of thing? So that's brilliant, but unfortunately it's such a small corner of the publishing industry that it almost doesn't count as publishing industry. It's, you know, it's it's just such a, um, it, the, the indie, 
press itself is such a different beast. And I think I'm sort of hoping that more um, that more companies like um, like that sort of open up and uh, provide the service for books and provide the kind of difference and the kind of diversity that uh, readers want, I think, because in general, readers want diversity. Nobody wants to read the same book over and over again because we've already got it on our shelves and we're happily reading it twice. So, you know, we don't want to write read um, the the same the same story over and over again I think for the most for the most part that's what I mean there are so I mean it is I think I think that we're not I don't think we're with the same publishing company Lynn and we still our books are you with Bold Stroke oh no I'm I'm no, Bold Stroke for some no. reason I thought we were both Bold no, Strokes <laughs> there's a few from Western Super Lesbic I think with yes. books that I've met but yeah but yeah. I think as well there are sort of some of the small presses uh they are growing in size as well so i think that you know readers this is kind of you know if people support small small presses are where the diversity is coming in so if people support the small presses um they they're going to have more funding to promote these voices so i think the power is all of us that we can contribute to that um but yeah i think that there is hope but there's more yes, to do. definitely I think it's it's growing you know we're seeing more from uh we're not just seeing hatchet and and penguin and, and so on we are seeing a little bit more um in the mainstream but it is it's obvious as with everything it's very very hard to get past the ma those major companies yeah 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 okay i'm very conscious that we're we um we've overrun slightly but it's been such a fantastic conversation and I'm, I'm sure like most people, I don't want it to end. Just have one final question before we could literally sort of like plow through the questions box and see if there's any questions to answer. Um, and I think I want to broaden the conversation beyond, you know, just literature itself really and think about the world we live in uh, that forms much of the inspiration that sort of like all, that both of you talked about so eloquently throughout this conversation i mean i sure like me you can sort of like look back on your own life and the things that have happened you know in the during the world throughout you know your own lifetimes and think of wonderful things that have happened that you could never have possibly imagined happening in terms of diversity and also maybe things that didn't you know didn't quite sort of like literally have the same sort of like traction so with an eye on the future where do you think the, 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 the journey of diversity is going, is heading in a, in a positive direction? You know, what do you imagine the future might look like? And also, and this is a, perhaps a difficult thing to imagine, is what people in the future might make of us as a, as a society now in the world today? Well, um, my, uh, I've got a lot of hope and a lot of fear in terms of diversity for the future, because I, my eldest child is thirteen and they're non-binary. They came up when they came out when they were seven, as definitely not the gender that they were assigned at birth. But they didn't quite know where they, what exactly they wanted to identify as. So it's been a little bit of a journey finding out their identity, and they now firmly identify as non-binary. And their, um, <clears throat> you know, the fact that at as seven they were able to. Um, to, to realize that something's not quite right about my uh, my self identification and I am I am able to say it and I'm not scared to say it um you know that gives me a lot of hope the fact that we moved to a little village and I was afraid of of homophobia and of transphobia in this tiny little rural village where we live now and turns out it's the most sapphic village in the world you know? <laughs> you know we we end up here and like there's uh two two lesbian couples who have kids in my in my kids class and they're all sort of like oh hey hey another queer person and stuff like that um and it's sort of that gives me an awful lot of hope the fact that my kids pride club in school is so is so thriving the fact that um you know that teachers in the school one of them is as out and uh, as bisexual and uh, the fact that when I asked the school straight up, hey, um, so my child's non-binary, what are you going to do about it? Essentially ready for a fight. 
and they were like, oh, okay, we'll make sure their pronouns are written clearly on their on their register, and they, if they need to, they can use these other than not gen, uh, the gender neutral toilets. Um, it's a bit further fraught from their specific classroom, but it'll change in different years, and um, so that made it obviously feels incredibly positive, and that is the way it should be going. It should be a non-issue. It should be a sort of like, you know, oh, my child. Uh, my child uh, likes the colour blue, my child is not binary. It should be that that kind of level of not an issue, you know? Um, but of course, I am also very aware that uh, things are not, you know, not perfect. And I just live in a very, um, I just very have lucked out in this, with this particular school and this particular village and this particular area. And so, of course, I am afraid of the future but I'm also very hopeful because I don't think that my child had they been born 10 20 years ago would have been experiencing the same things and so it's I'm very cautiously hopeful that things are changing in secondary schools as far as I can see um however having said that you know I have my my um I've had long chats with my friend's daughter who is um who's black and she says that she still gets people coming and asking their stupid question so uh there is still quite some way to go and I imagine that people of the future will look back and go wow that's I'm glad we've come further so I do I do hope that we continue to move in a positive direction and we don't have um a load of backsliding because I know that that progress is not linear and I hope that let's hope it's more linear than, than than less I think yeah I mean I also choose to be hopeful I choose yeah. to believe in a in a in a possible utopia um it's you know there's been through there is there are so many horrific examples of, of discrimination that people face you know, uh, issues around inaccessibility with people with disabilities and uh, homophobia and, and 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 all of this stuff, and um, and 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 you can see so much divisiveness as well. You can see you don't have to 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 go far to see the the divisiveness between you know different ways of thinking, groups of people, people grouping themselves, and I just think we need to stay positive I think we just need to and I, and I see examples of it in uh, communities in the pride community in the writing communities in the poetry community that I'm now in where there are these examples of lots of different people from lots of different diverse backgrounds with lots of different representative issues going on and are forming really nice communities where they are based in respect and tolerance and good listening to each other's experience and people not trying to clamber over each other, but mm. work together. And I'm seeing that in, 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 in real life. I see it when I go to pride events here in Exeter. I see it when I go to my, my poetry community. There's sometimes there are disagreements of people not quite understanding, but I'm seeing the, the, the listening and the tolerance and the respect. And I see it when I go to sci-fi fantasy conventions, it's, you know, they're really kind of, that's really strong, strong current there. Um, and, and, and that's the thing is, that's why diversity is so important. When you get into those diverse environments, you get more listening. Yeah. And 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 with that, it kind of shows it's possible. Mm -hmm. So all of these yes. other examples of it's divisive and discriminatory and intolerant. You know, we don't need intolerance. We need flexibility and we need an openness to learn and 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 be challenged and to challenge ourselves. And and so I think that I'm really inspired by the fact that these big communities exist. I tap into them and um and it's positive and everybody can feel a sense of belonging there regardless of you know what their sort of diverse backdrop is you know might be um it's 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 really it's an equality in action and also yes. young people looking at young people you know and the kind of questioning that's going on with young people yes. there's hope right there of um of sort of leaning away from divisiveness leaning away from binaries uh life is way more complex than that so i think there's a lot to be hopeful for and I think it's so important for people to get out and join those communities that they can find, you know, like the poetry, your poetry community. And like you said, the pride groups and um, the writing communities, if we can find uh, communities 
uh, in on the ground near where we are, I think it's so important to become part of those because that is where you find the real hope. That's where you find the the hopeful stories, I think. Yeah. Obviously, it's where you, you also, like you said, you find disagreements and so on and 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 so on. But um, you also find, I think that's where you can get the most hope. Um, thank you both. I've just been looking through as you were both talking, but obviously diligently listening at the same time to, to the Q&A box. And it seems, Lynn, as though you've actually been, I cannot believe this, managed to answer, <laughs> answer all of the questions. Not all of them. There's we... one about Married at First Sight Australia, which I do not watch. So I didn't really feel like I had much to say about that. <laughs> well, I, I, I also haven't watched it because strangely enough, I don't watch Australian TV. Oh, I think it's on um, British TV. I've seen the adverts, but it's not my jam. So, but yeah. Um, the, the, just a couple actually that I think give you a, ch a chance, Susie, because I'm obviously we're we're really we've really overrun. We've really overrun, um, and we don't have much time at all. And I know that everybody's busy and have lives to lead. Um, so one of the, one of the first questions I think, which was quite heartfelt really was I've become disabled in the past couple of years and want to write about my experience those with disabilities like mine um, there are very few support groups or websites about my disability so I'm not able to communicate with others how do you ensure you represent well without the character becoming a martyr type or alternatively being made fun of I thought that's such a good question definitely and that's actually that was the reason I started writing the answers to the comments is because I saw that one and I was like I want to make sure that that one gets answered at least I think just make a start on writing mm. and sometimes when we write about something that's really close to us and that might be quite uh, emotionally challenging sometimes it might take more time to be able to find the distance, to be able to do it from a slightly stand back point of view, because you have to be able to do it with clarity as well. But just start writing, just yeah. start writing. Actually, that was uh, the experience that I had when I wrote um, the the first character, the only character I've ever written with um, dissociative identity disorder. As I, I wrote, it took me a long time to finish that, a long time to get into that because it is. Um, it's it's almost scary to write mm. about um, and so yeah be gentle with yourself as well mm. um, and also you know I, I wasn't sure what you meant by being made fun of but I think do you mean like making them into a Mary Sue because if you want to stop it go for it you know the whole concept of a Mary Sue is a little bit um, uh, it's it's okay you know it, like it's I think there are worse things than to have a character who is brilliant. Um, so, you know, if you, if that's what you mean by made fun of for your character, um, go for, just write write them uh, from the heart. And if they are a Mary too, if they are amazing, then that's okay. And you can always edit it. You know, you can always change it so that they're not brilliant at everything. And that's fine too. Um, yes, I mean, I think I think it really there's there's just not one way of doing anything. No. So, and, and I think when you know when we when we write something, we need to write something that we're passionate about. Otherwise, yes. we're not going to stay in it for the long haul. And there's always a long haul with the edits. So always start by writing something that you're passionate about. If that's something that might come from a place that feels difficult for whatever reason, sometimes it's the case where you know you need to put your passion and your emotion into it. And sometimes it does need a little bit of time to mellow so that you can just take a little bit of a step back so you can reflect with clarity. But sometimes that's also not the case either. And it's good just to go in. When I I had I had an illness five years ago and a year after that illness, I picked up the final edits of my book, The Warder, and I did a massive rework and I added a character, a brand new character, it was directly inspired from my own experiences of psychosis in hospital. So it was actually really, really terrifying, but I was completely mm -hmm. driven to do it. And I got it right first time. And that's the only time I've ever got it right. I've always needed to spend time stepping back and reflecting to find the clarity. But my passion and drive and the, the colour and the vision of that 
was it made my it made that book and I was really pleased with it so yes. there is no one way to do it if you're overly concerned about the outcome it's a surefire way to stop yourself and give yourself a bout of writer's block you mm. just have to write and just have faith that there'll always be edits and you can always get advice and feedback from different okay. places along the way yeah and right you know the first draft doesn't matter nobody can nobody's going to see it you if you want to write your character as much of a martyr as you feel at that moment write them as much cringe as you possibly can the first draft of all of my stories sometimes the plot makes no sense <laughs> there are massive plot holes and I read them back and I go oh I'm gonna have to rewrite all that and other times I read back and I go wow that's really cringy but it doesn't matter because it got it out it got the story out there are parts of that you're going to keep mm -hmm. and there are parts of it you're going to rewrite and you're going to make it more true to what you wanted it to be. But that first draft has to come out mm -hmm. and the best way to get it out is, like Susie said, just write it. It's just um, blur it out on the page, you know. My my first draft is, my first draft of every book I write is pretty awful. It's mm -hmm. every single time, and it's not even it doesn't even feel really like a draft. It's more just like a me telling myself the story. Exactly. So the the cringy bit there's always cringe. The cringy bits are relevant. Is the overall story arc working? Is it what I want it to be? And actually, that carries on for a fair few drafts. Mm -hmm. um, when I look at the finished products of all of my novels there uh, I have all of it is gone I mean the first draft it has all been deleted uh several times over before it gets anywhere close to the final draft but you have to go through that process before you can know who your characters are and what they would actually say and how you would actually prefer that they spoke in that moment or you can't get there bef without doing the without doing the the quite cringeworthy drafts you can't it's a process Exactly. Um, I am going to have to leave. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, just to say, um, thank you to, uh, to both Lynn and for Susie for being here today and to, for sharing their insights and experiences and perspectives with us. Uh, and also as well, I think for, for giving us a really, really powerful reminder of the role that writers play in promoting understanding uh, promoting and understanding empathy and inclusivity as well, just like literally making us all sort of like more aware as human beings. And, and thank you for everybody here that was present to actually take part in this conversation today.